Hello, my name is Connor Hicks. I'm the founder of Suborbital Software Systems, and today I'm going to be talking about creating an extensible cloud native application using WebAssembly. We're going to talk about what exactly we're trying to accomplish here, and then we're going to go through the technology and what it enables us to do, and then we will close out by talking about some caveats and things to look out for if you want to adopt some of these approaches. So what are we trying to do? Well, the name of the game here is making developers' lives easier. We want to allow them to take advantage of the software and services that they're already using to a higher degree. We want them to be able to get the most out of them by integrating them together, by making them uh, you know, conform more closely to exactly what they're hoping to accomplish. And we want them to be able to do this in a way that makes sense to them, which you know is code. So we're talking about two slightly different problems here. The first is extensibility, which is the idea of connecting multiple applications or multiple services together. And then we're also talking about customizability, which is taking you know the product you're looking at and actually making it work exactly the way you want and, and maybe changing the product to fit your needs more closely. So uh, if we first look at extensibility, we really want to enable developers to reach out and connect applications to other things in their toolbox that you know need the data that is potentially siloed within applications that they use every day. And to do this, we want them to be able to connect to APIs. We want them to be able to connect to the network and actually interact with other services and you know funnel data from one to the other. In order to do this, we need to provide hook points in an application to you know, enable the developer to take data from a certain point in the logical flow and funnel it to other places, make decisions uh, based on it and, and other kinds of actions. And the kind of overall goal with extensibility is creating these workflows. So we want developers to be able to shuttle data from product A product B and product C to actually accomplish some kind of business task and make their lives easier. And when we're talking about customizability, it's really about taking the current product that you're working on and actually make it uh, conform more closely to the task at hand. So maybe it's you know operating close to the way that you need to, but you need to change certain parameters, you need to change certain behaviors to make it perfectly fit your company and your workflow. So some examples of this is, you know, in data pipelines, for example, you can augment, scrub, transform data as it's flowing. Uh, and, you know, another example is taking customers with very particular compliance needs or legal needs uh, or maybe time based events like like sales uh, in an e-commerce store and letting developers account for these in the very specific ways that they need. So. Let's talk for a minute about the current way that this is done throughout a lot of the industry, and that is webhooks. Now, a webhook is a, an HTTP request or some kind of network request sent from one server to another to indicate that some kind of event has happened. So if a service that you're using uh, you know, produces some kind of event, it can send a request to your server, to a, a server that you run, in order to notify you that something's happened, provide some details about that event, and allow you to do some kind of action with it, um, and I want to get into a, for a, for a minute about you know why these are not the ideal solution to this kind of problem. There's three main reasons that you know we we don't particularly love working with webhooks. The first is performance. By nature, a webhook has to go over the public internet, uh, and this incurs an inherent amount of latency that you know is acceptable in a lot of uh, a lot of situations, but there are times where this really affects performance because you know two servers could be an entire ocean away from each other. They could be uh, many hundreds of milliseconds away, and it can really impact the amount of data that you're able to process using webhooks. And in, in, on top of that, the server receiving the request. Uh, you know, we, we honestly don't know anything about it. If we are the, the service provider, we don't know anything about the server that is receiving this webhook request. And so it could be an ancient Perl software running on a mainframe in the basement, and it could take 
ages to respond, uh, you know, we just don't know. And so there's a lot of variability when it comes to that. Uh, the next thing that we think about with webhooks is security. There's no real standardized way for the sender of a webhook and the receiver to validate each other's identities to ensure that nothing malicious is happening. And so different uh, you know, webhook service providers need to basically build bespoke systems based on digital signatures or certificates that the, you know, the receiver then needs to deal with. And they can often vary greatly between different service providers. Uh, which is you know not great for the receiver to have to deal with. And there is the inherent problem of sending potentially very sensitive information over the internet. We can't always allow this. There are certain you know uh, industries that just can't deal with sending uh, sensitive information over the public internet, even if it is TLS encrypted. And so webhooks can often not be an acceptable solution there. And the final thing, when we think about webhooks is the burden that it puts on the end user, right? They can be very, you know, flexible and convenient, but at the end of the day, the user receiving the webhook still needs to set up some kind of infrastructure in order to receive these webhook messages. So that involves standing up some kind of cloud infrastructure, whether it's a, you know, VM or a Lambda or something like that. And then they need to write software to uh, receive that, handle the, handle the events as needed, and that software needs to be tested. It needs to be maintained. It needs to you know, ensure it doesn't go down, all these kinds of uh, tasks that are just inherently work that needs to be done when dealing with webhook type integrations. So there's another kind of category of integrations that we talk about, which is these native integrations, which is you know, a, a pre-built type of integration that a, a particular application provides. And you know, it, it's completely controlled by the service provider so it's something like you know connect to github these kinds of integrations that you you know create a, a secure connection between two applications which is which is really great because it's usually based on a standard like oauth but the the drawback to this kind of integration is that they are very limited in in the customization the the service provider needs to create user interface uh, to configure and tweak how the integration works and there's only so many options that they can provide and so you're always going to be limited in the options there and one thing that this type of integration will very rarely address is the need to, to actually send data and integrate with on-prem or legacy type systems where uh, you know it's, it's very unlikely that a service provider is going to put in the effort required to you know add a bespoke uh, integration just for one you know application that your company is running on a server uh, the, you know it's very unlikely unless you pay them a lot of money that they're going to do that work for you so when you have you know when you find yourself in this kind of situation you pretty much just have to fall back to webhooks which is we've already kind of covered that so there must be a better way that's kind of the question that i have been asking myself and i, I do believe that there is a better way and this is to actually embed the user's logic directly into the application in question. So the service provider that is allowing their user to you know, integrate with other products can actually let the developer or the user fully you know, add their own extension and their own logic into the application itself. And I think you know where we're going with this. WebAssembly is a really good tool to enable this. So why would we want to embed the user logic directly? Well, it kind of speaks to the exact uh, problems that we saw with webhooks earlier, which is performance, security, and the burden put on the end user. Running a WebAssembly-based function directly inside of an application's you know, service is much higher performance than sending a request over the internet. You can execute these functions directly within the same compute that is running the actual application itself. And so you don't have to traverse the network. You don't need to um, deal with all of the uncertainty and latency that the internet uh, provides. And we have a much higher level of security because pretty much the same reasons we don't need to send data over a public network we can keep the information completely within a private trusted uh, network and ensure 
that there is no need to validate identities, validate signatures in the first place because the infrastructure is completely under control of the service provider. And finally, it lowers the burden on the end user. The user does not need to set up infrastructure and monitor that infrastructure because they can simply give the code to be executed to the service provider and the service provider can handle that. So the user can build these integrations and set up these types of workflows with a much lower cost than if they had to build these servers and set up this infrastructure on their own. So why is WebAssembly a good candidate for building these kinds of integrations? Well, uh, from, from all of the conversations I've had with people across the industry over the last couple of months, uh, there are a couple of things that they get really excited about when we talk about this kind of functionality. Uh, you know, the ability for developers to use languages they're already familiar with to build these kinds of integrations is a big selling point. It's what they are currently doing with webhook servers minus all the headaches of setting up and monitoring infrastructure so they can use languages that they already know to make your product work the way that they want to. And WebAssembly has a very fast startup time. It is a much more lightweight solution than a container because there's just frankly a lot less stuff inside a WebAssembly module compared to a container. So when you are looking to execute a WebAssembly module, the, the startup time is usually single digit milliseconds in the, in the average case, and it makes it really easy to you know, have a high volume and a high th amount of throughput uh, even when you are loading a function from storage uh, for, a, for a cold start. And lastly, the WebAssembly security model kind of goes beyond just like, oh, I am executing a function in my local network. Uh, we can actually go beyond those security properties and actually have a high degree of control over what the code in that WebAssembly sandbox is able to do because of the way that WebAssembly is designed and the way that the WebAssembly runtime interacts with the host machine that is executing that code. So we can uh, have a high degree of control over what the user's code is allowed to do and ensure that it is not doing anything malicious. So let's take a quick look at some examples here. This is a function that I imagine would run inside of a SaaS application when a new user has joined the service. And you could imagine uh, the developer wanting to decide what happens when a new customer uh, joins their, you know, their account. They can do things like, hey, you know, this user's company has more than 500 people, so let's send a, a Slack message to our sales team. <clears throat> but, you know, for, for all other cases, let's just add them to our, to our customer, uh, to our CRM as usual and get a pretty high degree of control over what can happen here. And you can imagine the, the, the logic here being whatever you want. Because you have code to express your desires, you, you really can do whatever you want in these cases, and it allows you to bend the application to your will, essentially, and integrate it with the various tools that you are already using. So this is written in assembly script, and you can see that in you know just a couple of lines, we were able to accomplish what would have taken a fair amount of effort to stand up in a traditional webhook server way. So flipping over to the other side and looking at the host application and what it takes to actually execute one of these functions, you know, WebAssembly runtimes and, and these integrations have come a very long way in the last couple of months and the last few years. It's now become quite easy to take advantage of WebAssembly, load these functions from, from storage and execute them. We, we can, what you can see here is, a, is basically a full example of doing this. You can imagine storing WebAssembly modules in something like an S3 bucket, loading them on demand as needed and executing that with the data that you, you know, need the function to handle. And we're doing that here in just you know, maybe 15 lines of code. This is using our Reactor project, which is a multi-tenant WebAssembly runtime for Go. Uh, but there are many different ways that you could go about this. You know, this is this is our project, so of course I'm highlighting it here. But there are many different ways that you can accomplish this, and it just goes to show that you know th this is not 
a difficult thing to try out if you are thinking about adding this kind of extensibility to your application I, I highly suggest that you go and experiment and, and try this out because I think you'd be surprised at the the low amount of effort required to get this kind of thing up and running and the last thing that I'll highlight with the with the code example here is that you can very tightly control what these functions are allowed to do. So when you're executing user code, you wanna make sure that you are giving them the abilities that they need in order to accomplish their business tasks without unduly compromising your infrastructure and your application. So with Reactor and with you know the suborbital set of projects, you can declaratively and very simply control what these functions can do. So this is a, this is a subset of a, a configuration file that shows you some of the things you can configure. For example, we're allowing the user to make network requests with HTTP or GraphQL, but we are disallowing things like internal cluster DNS domains because we don't want the user to be able to access internal services. So we have a fairly high degree of control here. And if we were to disable all of these capabilities, then the code would have n access to nothing. They would, you know, the, the, they would be able to, for example, process data and maybe transform it. And this can be useful in some situations like a data pipeline, but for a lot of the applications and a lot of the integrations that we're talking about here, um, you know, the, the ability to make network requests is very important. So we want to do this in a safe way by, you know, controlling the capability and ensuring that the user cannot access anything that they're not allowed to. And we'll take a quick peek at performance here um, before we move on. And I ran a very simple set of tests using uh, some, some inexpensive cloud instances. Uh, you know, I, I spun up instances in two different regions of the same cloud provider, and I ran some tests of sending webhook messages between them compared to executing embedded WebAssembly functions. And the, uh, you know, the, the performance is, is quite profound you can see that when sending webhooks, you know, even among within the same cloud provider, two different regions, uh, the, the latency is, is averaged out to um, 30 milliseconds. And so we, you know, over the 30 second window that we were measuring, uh, we were able to get around 5,000 events in that time period. Whereas when we were running the embedded WebAssembly functions, we were able to get, you know, an order of, almost an order of magnitude more executions into that time period because of the extremely low latency, the low startup time, etc. And uh, it's it's important to note that there's there's going to be this cost to the end user. So that the ten dollars a month that you see there, that was the cost that we, uh, you know, were paying for these instances to do this test. Uh, you can probably get it cheaper down to maybe five dollars a month, but there's always going to be some kind of cost to that end user and. You know, this is without thinking about the engineering time it takes to set up this infrastructure, the monitoring and other, you know, auxiliary tasks that need to happen in order for this to be production ready. So it kind of highlights why uh, functions can be a really attractive option compared to a webhook type setup. So to close out here, we'll talk briefly about some caveats and things that you need to think about if you're considering setting this kind of thing up for your users. And I'll just run through them very quickly. And the first is that you need to be careful about the WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface and the, the capabilities provided by your WebAssembly runtime because you want to make sure you are locking these functions down. Malicious code is definitely rampant these days. We wanna be very careful. And so the example that I showed with the declarative uh, com configuration is something you need to take seriously and make sure that you are thinking about your threat profile and what you wanna protect against when you are configuring the WebAssembly runtime. Uh, the next is multi-tenancy. So uh, we have protections built into the Reactor project to ensure that when you are running many different functions together in the same instance that they are not going to be noisy neighbors and they are not going to chew up more memory or CPU or go on forever uh, and ensure that they are being good citizens and that these functions are you know just starting up doing what they want and then shutting down and not being you know bad. Um, this is something to keep in mind most of the WebAssembly runtimes will give you some controls to ensure that this doesn't happen but it's something to be aware of. Um, the next is something that uh, you may not consider right off the bat, but not all languages that can compile to WebAssembly have full support for all the different data formats. 
that you might be interested in, in working with. So for example, you may not be able to find an XML library for all of the different programming languages uh, that WebAssembly supports. So just be aware and do some research about that before you uh, commit to a particular language for your, for your customers. Um, the, the package ecosystem is another thing that you, you might not consider right off the bat. Uh, not, uh, not only will most packages not work, but um, you know, most packages will not work in interesting ways. So you can't just pull any old language uh, library off of the shelf from NPM or Cargo. You, you need to kind of do your research and know how these various libraries are going to interact with your WebAssembly runtime before you can offer them to your customer. And you probably can't just allow your customer to take anything they want off the shelf. Uh, you need to have a conversation with them and understand the requirements before you go and you know allow that kind of thing. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, you know cold starts do vary by language. So if you look at something like Swift that packages the entire Swift runtime into a WebAssembly module, this would take longer to do ahead of time compilation on. And so the startup time, while still better than a container, will take significantly longer than something like Rust. So you just need to keep in mind that not all languages are completely equal in the WebAssembly world, and you should probably do your own research and, and look at the performance numbers there. And uh, all of that uh, is kind of encapsulated in communicate with your users, ensure that they know the, the limitations and the capabilities and, and what these functions are able to do, set them up for success, make sure that they have the right expectations, because there is a lot you can do with this style of integration. It is a very powerful way of building software, but it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve every problem, and they need to be aware of that going into it. So with all of that said, uh, I'm going to end it here. Thank you so much for having me at the conference. Uh, I hope you'll come and check out Suborbital and look at the different things we have been working on in regards to embedded functions, uh, extensibility in SAS and uh, you know application development with WebAssembly. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.